<laughs> okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let's get started. Uh, so first of all, I just want to remind um, everyone that you should start doing your some kind of your uh, project, right? We got some um, major project report due. I think after the spring break, you should have enough time. So again, we just request you to do some kind of initial trials on the problems you want, right? If you're if you're uh, reading papers, please start reading the paper, right? Um, and we hope that uh, your midterm re uh, report, uh, you should formally, you should have formulated your problem and also um, tell us how much things you have done, right? And what's your next plan? And so, and, and also, right? So uh, don't just tell us, okay, we have just collected the data. Right? That's not sufficient. And you have, a, uh, if you choose to read papers, please at least uh, uh, read through one paper uh, in your choice. Right? Okay, so uh, let us continue with the uh, linear models. Right? So in the last lecture, we talked about uh, uh, how do we do the model selection, right? And uh, if we maximize the model evidence, um, uh, the, the model evidence here means that the log probability of the data, right? when you marginalize out all possible model parameters according to the distribution of the model parameters, right? So actually, it kind of uh, integrates all possible explanations from the model parameters um, for the data, right? So there is some kind of internal structure, which is a trade-off between the best fit to the data and also the complexity of your model, right? So that means if you maximize the model evidence, you're essentially finding the best trade-off between the data fitting and the model complexity. This is a uh, it's kind of like similar to what we usually do uh, for model selection, like cross validation, right? So, but the elegant part is that, okay, in Bayesian uh, framework, you can just uh, do in this model selection by maximizing the model evidence, right? This is called uh, type two maximum like, maximum like to estimation. And then we talk about uh, uh, several learning algorithms for different types of data, like binary classification, logistic regression, um, uh, probably regression, right? We talk about multi-class classification. We talk about uh, uh, ordinal multi-class classification, right? And uh, we introduced uh, a very efficient optimization scheme. It's called newton robson um, update, right? So we explain why, how this idea uh, was uh, motivated, right? They essentially use a quadratic function to approximate to the local uh, to, to, to local approximate target function, right? And then you use the optimal of the local quadrature approx uh, quadratic approximation to update your model parameters, right? Hopefully you can, uh, you capture and understand the basic idea. And it's not required that you should derive all those details updates, right? But at least you, you need to know the idea, the principle. And then, <clears throat> The last part we want to discuss about linear models is how do we uh, create a uh, generalized linear model in an exponential family. So uh, as we mentioned, uh, exponential family um, subsumes are a large family of common used uh, probabilistic models like Gaussian, like uh, um, Bernoulli, right? And uh, Dirichlet, all kinds of stuff, right? <clears throat> so I uh, naturally want to discuss, okay, if you have a, uh, uh, exponential likelihood over your data, right? So T here uh, represents uh, the observed data or collect data, right? So you assume that this data can be uh, explained by some exponential family um, distribution, right? And it's parameterized by eta, right? And here <clears throat> for simplicity, uh, we assume the form of exponential family is as follows, right? So uh, the sufficient statistics is just a t, but in the most general case, it should be some function of t, right? Uh, but yeah, let's just uh, keep it uh, as it is. Uh, we'll see later, right? All the results um, we have, uh, uh, we'll see later, also applies to the general statistic, uh, uh, statistics uh, definition, right? And eta here represents the, uh, the, the, the natural parameter. So <clears throat> the g of eta actually is the, log normalizer, right? We put it in an exponent, so it's a log normalizer. Right? <clears throat> and from our um, prior discussions, we know that there's a link between the 
natural parameters eta and the mean parameters one. So the mean parameters uh, uh, is actually the mean of your sufficient sufficient statistics, which is T here, given your current uh, um, distribution. Line. So we show that, we have showing that the mean parameters, which we denote by Y, is actually the gradient of the log normalizer G with respect to natural parameter E prime. So I, I assume that everyone has uh, tried to prove that uh, in your homework one. So, so this relationship builds the connection between the natural parameter and the mean parameter. So let us uh, denote this mapping from the mean parameter y to the natural parameter eta by this uh, mapping of function psi. Okay, so we denote the mapping, we denote the function, we denote eta uh, as a function of the mean parameter y, which is psi of y. So now let us uh, uh, look into, or let us kind of recall the uh, several examples we have used before. Right? We talk about the Gaussian likelihood. Uh, we talk about uh, the uh, uh, Bonoli likelihood, right? For example, both logistic regression and uh, uh, probability regression uses Bonoli likelihood, right? So the idea or the common point of all those models uh, is that we're gonna model the mean parameter with this form. Okay. So we're gonna first uh, introduce a linear combination of the uh, features, right? So phi of x is, means that transform feature vector or basis feature vector, whatever, right? So we first introduce the score, which is in the product between the weight vector and the transform feature vector. That's why this is called linear model because the linear structure is, 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 is defined here. Then we're gonna apply some transformation function f to get our mean parameter. Right? So if we can instantiate this, right? So for Gaussian distribution, right? The Gaussian distribution will assume that your mean of the Gaussian is just uh, the dot product between the weight vector and the feature vector, right? And of course, you got some uh, got some variance, sorry, something like that. Right? So, so here in the, in the Gaussian case, f is just the, the identity mapping. Right? It's just identity mapping it means that you don't do anything. Right? But for the Bonoli likelihood, so we know that the likelihood is like y to the power of t, y minus y to the power of um, y minus t. T is either one or zero, right? It's an observation. But y is for the model as uh, some sigmoid function of this uh, inner product, right? So you can see that f essential here is the sigma function, right? Remember, Bonoli likelihood is, is obviously a member in the exponential family, right? And for the probability regression, we use uh, Gaussian CDF instead of uh, the sigma function, right? Right. So through these uh, three uh, particular instances, we can see the general modeling uh, strategy, right? So we usually model the mean parameter of your likelihood as some kind of function of a linear combination of the basis functions or features, right? So now in the exponential family, right? How do we how do we choose f to be convenient? Right? So <clears throat> remember, from the exponential family, we know there's a mapping from the mean parameter to the natural parameter eta, which is a function psi, right? So now we require that we're gonna choose f to be the inverse of psi. That's our definition. We require that uh, if we want to build up a linear model for any exponential family like we could, I'm gonna require my f choice to be the inverse of this psi function. Right? So then let us look at what insight can we see from this, from this choice of f. Right? So we know that eta, the natural parameter, is a psi of the 
mean parameter y, right? And mean parameter y is modeled as this guy, right? Because it's just f as psi inverse, right? So psi inverse of this uh, linear structure, w transpose v of x, right? Now, if we want to compute the corresponding natural parameter accordingly, right? We, we're going to apply psi again. Right? Then we can observe that, okay, it is a psi composite with psi inverse with this uh, dot product, right? So psi composite with psi inverse just cancel. Then it gives us the result that actually, if we demand F be psi inverse, it equivalent to modeling the natural parameter as a, a linear combination of the transform feature vector or basis function. And you will see that actually for the case, for the cases we just uh, discussed, like Gaussian likelihood, like Bernoulli likelihood, uh, like logistic or probate regression case, right? Their F choice is exactly the inverse of psi. You can double check by yourself. So here we call F inverse. So F inverse essentially psi, right? It's a link function, which link, well, it's called link function because it is uh, actually the underlying link between the expectation and natural parameters. So now, oh, before I, uh, before we talk about like general training framework, any question? Okay, so now let us talk about uh, how do we estimate the model parameters, right? So uh, from our requirement of the modeling of the F, right? You know, F is a uh, inverse of psi, right? <clears throat> we can build up our generalized linear models, which is to say we model our natural parameters as a linear model. It's a linear combination of the feature vector features, right? And then suppose we have, we have a collected uh, N training examples, X1, T1 to Xn, Tn. If we want to accordingly estimate the model parameters W, and how can we do that? Again, we're gonna use uh, the maximum likelihood estimation framework. That means we're gonna um, take the log likelihood of the data, right? Which is uh, summation over this, this guy, this exponential family, remember that the form is uh, like eta times Tn, subtracted by g of uh, eta n, oh, sorry, it's eta n, right? So if you take a logarithm, you take out the exponent, you will get this summation over eta n, tn, subtracted by g of eta n, right? So eta n, we modeled as uh, the W transpose with uh, uh, phi n, right? The feature vector for the nth example, right? So if you take the gradient with respect to W, it give you this result, right? So this guy, partial eta n over partial w n subtract, uh, times t n subtracted by this guy, right? We can use the chain rule. We can first compute the gradient of g with respect to eta n, then multiply with partial eta n over partial w, right? So if we can do the further, we can do some kind of little bit um, derivation. We know that because eta n equals to w transpose phi x n, then its derivative with respect to W will simply be the feature vector, phi eta n, right? I mean, let me use this color, red color, right? And for this guy, okay. what's this? What is partial G? G is uh, the log normalizer, right? What is the, 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 the gradient norm, the log normalizer with respect to eta n? Yeah, exactly, right? I heard that. So we're gonna use this uh, result again, right? The gradient of the log normalizer with respect to its uh, natural parameter is actually the mean, right? Which is the mean parameter y n. So now you, you just uh, merge the terms. You now you can see that the gradient has the following structure. So it is summation over the product between each feature vector and the difference between your observation Tn and your mean parameter one. Right. 
So in, in practice, like if you want to make some prediction, right? Although you're gonna use uh, some exponential family distribution to model the data, right? To model the output is a distribution, but if you want to make a prediction, the most natural and most easy convenient way is just to use the mean, right? To make your prediction. So that's why we often use this yn as your prediction. So now you can see that in each segment, you're gonna compute the difference between your observation tn and your prediction, which is the mean, right? And this is actually the prediction error. Okay. And then we're going we're gonna to add, add up all those uh, um, uh, summons together, right? So each summon is actually the feature vector weighted by your prediction error. Then you can use this uh, gradient to update a model parameter step, right? You can use uh, stochastic gradient descent, you can use the gradient descent, you can use second order gradient uh, optimization approaches, whatever. Right? So we have taken uh, our machine learning class before, right? When we talk about linear regression, of course it's not you know, a probabilistic uh, framework, right? We actually calculate the gradient of the square loss with respect to W as well, right? But the space is the same structure. I mean, you are not required to, to review the previous uh, book or slides, right? But just to, just let, uh, want, want to uh, attract your attention. This is actually the same structure. Right? It's a weighted summation of the feature vector and the weight is actually the prediction error. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, then um, we have uh, finished our discussion about uh, the generalized linear models. So uh, what, what do we expect you to know, right? So you should know what's the definition of design matrix, which is essentially a stack of the feature vector or transform feature vector. And this is called design matrix or data matrix, right? And how do we obtain the maximum likelihood estimation for linear regression? How do we obtain a posterior and predictive distribution of a linear regression, right? This one might be um, really easy for everyone, right? But this one is actually the key to understand the flavor of Bayesian learning right? or probabilistic learning, because we really care about how the posterior distribution of something of interest, right? Like model parameters, like prediction, vary along with more and more data, right? More and more training data, right? And what is the empirical base principle? What is type two MLE, right? And what is Newton Robson method for logistic regression, right? Uh, you don't need to memorize the updating rule, but you do need to uh, understand what's the idea of Newton Robson uh, scheme, right? What is the probability regression? Uh, what is the equivalent augmented model, right? We we'll talk about why we prefer probability regression in Bayesian literature because it allows us to uh, augment model with some latent variable, right? We can first sample some latent Gaussian random variable. And according to the sign of that random variable, you can determine the label, right? That will make your uh, life a lot easier if you really want to compute posterior distribution, right? Um, how do we conduct multi-class classification? What is generalized linear model? What is link function? What is the general form of the gradient? Again, you don't need to memorize the form, but just uh, keep in mind that there's some kind of structure in the gradient. Okay, next we're gonna talk about an even wider family of probabilistic models, which is called uh, probabilistic graphing models. So basically we can view all kinds of models, all kinds of probabilistic models as uh, graphic models. So what is probabilistic model or what is probabilistic graphic model? So uh, we can view it, this type of models as a marriage between the graph theory and probability theory. In short, it uses graphs to represent probabilistic models and uses graphs to explain structure inside a model and help you to the, to the inference. And the graph structure can reflect the conditional independency of the model. So we'll see later, right? If you use graph structure to represent the complex relationship between and run the variables um, of interest that uh, you see is very intuitive, it's very convenient, and also help you to 
uh, came more understanding and insight about, about the model. And then we'll talk about how to calculate or estimate things of interest in the graphic model. And you see that inference uh, is also depending on the graphic structure. We'll talk about two types of uh, inference algorithm. One is called sum product, uh, one the other is called maxim. Okay? And uh, it is easy to implement, it is easy to analyze and, and to improve. And I will also mention that, okay, if your graph structure is not that good, like uh, when the graph structure um, is chain or tree, and usually you can use this uh, inference model to get exact positive probability. But if the graph structure contains uh, cycles, contains loops, there is no guarantee on that. But we can still apply um, that kind of some product or max sum algorithm. In that case, um, this algorithm is called message passing algorithm. Okay. We'll, I will, we'll explain that later. And, and finally, I just want to uh, mention that your networks are just instances of graphing models. Okay. So here's the plan. So uh, we, in general, we have like two types of graphing models. One is called the Bayesian neural networks. The other is called the Markov random view. So Bayesian neural networks, oh, sorry, it's not Bayesian neural networks, it's Bayesian networks, right? So Bayesian networks uh, are directed graphing models, meaning that a graph is directed, and the edges has directions, it has arrows. And for Markov random field, it is on directly graphing models. And then, uh, for both Bayesian networks and Markov random field, they can, they can be, if you want to uh, make your inference easier and in a, uni in a unified framework, we can all, we can represent both types of networks or graph, graph models in, a fact, uh, in, in, in the form of factor graphs. Right? Then we're, we're gonna talk about the general inference framework on this factor, gra uh, on this factor graphs. We call it some product algorithm, we call it max product and max sum algorithms. Okay, so let us first uh, talk about Bayesian networks. So what is Bayesian networks? Before we introduce what is Bayesian network, right? we, we first uh, look at the base rule. So we want to say, we want to use base rule to get some comp the, the composition structure over the drawn probability for arbitrary uh, probability model. Right? How can we see that? Right? So we know that for base rule, suppose we we'll, we'll have two random variables, x2 and x1. Base rule tells us that the conditional probability of x2 given x1 can be computed as uh, the joint probability of x1, x2 divided by the marginal probability of x1, right? So if we multiply the denominator on the right-hand side to the left-hand side, we can see some decomposition over the drawn probability, right? So you can see that P of X1, X2 equals to P of X1 times P of uh, X2 given X1, right? right? So it's uh, very straightforward to extend to multiple random variables. Right? So suppose we got N random variables, X1 and X in our model, right? And, but just the recursive will apply the uh, base rule, we have a decomposition structure over the strong probability, which is P of X1 times P of X2 given X1, times P of X3 given X1, X2, right? And da, 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 until P of Xn given all the previous random variables, X1 to X minus one, right? So what does this uh, decomposition structure Tell us. Actually, tells us uh, how do we sample, sequential sample, this n random variables. It actually defines a sampling procedure of this n random variables x1 to xn. How do we see that? Right? So, from this uh, decomposition, right, we, if you want to get a sample for x1 to xn. How can we do that? We can first sample x1 
from this uh, marginal probability P of X1, right? And uh, given X1, we're gonna sample X2 from, uh, let me, X2 from X2 given probability of X2 given X1, right? And then given X1, X2, we can sample X3. And so on, right? And, and finally, we're gonna sample Xn given all the samples, all, all the previous random variables, namely X1 to X to minus one, right? So you can see that this rule tells us that for actually probabilistic system, like right, you got a sequential way to sample every random variable. Right? That's what base rule tells us. Does it make sense for everyone? Okay. So <clears throat> next we're gonna use a graphical representation to represent this sampling procedure. So this graphical representation is called Bayes Bayesian network. So how to see that? So let's just, uh, for simplicity, let's just consider three random variables, A and B and C, right? So by apply the base rule, uh, we got the joint probability of A and B and C can be decomposed as uh, P of A times P of B given A times P of C given A and B, right? So how do we use a graph to represent this joint probability or how do we use a graph to represent, we're gonna first assemble A, they give A sample B, they give A and B sample C, right? Naturally, right? We can use a node to represent each random variable, right? And then, because in the product, right, in this product, which represents the joint probability, right? Each term in this product is kind of like conditional probability, right? Of course, at the very beginning, right? P of A doesn't have any conditional part, right? So, so we can view the conditioned part as some parent and the target variable as some child. So we're gonna emit an edge from the parent to the child. If you take a look for this particular model, right? We got a P of A, this is A, right? And uh, P of A is not conditional distribution. It doesn't condition anything. So it doesn't have any parent. There's no incoming edge pointing to A, right? But if we look at the second probability, which is P of B given A, so it's conditional on A, right? So we can view A as parent of the node B. So we're gonna emit an edge from A to B. So this represents this edge corresponds to this, right? And next, we move to the third. Third distribution, right? So now it's the P of C given A and B. So it is conditioned on two variables, A and B, right? So C can be viewed to have a, viewed as having two, par two parents, right? So we're gonna emit Two edges, right? One coming from A, the other coming from B, and both edges pointing to C. So now we have uh, created our Bayesian network. Okay. So from the Bayesian network, it's very easy to see the sampling procedure, right? So first we're gonna look at those nodes who don't have any parents, right? So starting from them, right? So here we have A who doesn't have any parent, meaning that it doesn't condition. It is not conditioned any variable, right? So we're gonna sample A, right? We're gonna sample A first, right? And then we'll look at the variables uh, which only which are only conditional on A, right? So here there's only one variable, only conditional A, which is B, right? So we're gonna sample B given A using this distribution, right? And then we look at the variables uh, 
which are only conditional on A and B, right? or at most A and B. Right? Then we see, okay, this C, then we can sample C given A and B, or conditional A and B. Does it make sense? Question. Uh, that's a very good question. Yeah, that will be down a very uh, heavy data point. Yeah, we'll move to that uh, like more general uh, definition later. Like you see that, you know, if you, if you see like 100 data points, right? So remember each data point is essentially a random variable. You're gonna draw a graph which generate or sample each data point. But we'll, we'll come to that later. And other question. Okay, so here's the rule to uh, create a Bayesian network to represent the joint probability for the sampling procedure according to a specific joint probability. Right? So we use a node to represent each random variable in your probability model. Right? And for each conditional distribution in the drawn probability, which in general can be written as form like P of A given B1 to BM, I suppose they in general have a M parents. M can be can be can be zero, right? M, M be zero meaning that it is not conditional condition on anything, right? And then we're gonna add an edge from every parent B of I to A. So the random variables in the condition parts are represented as parents of the target variable A. If no condition parts, the node has no parents. That means the node doesn't have any incoming edge. You're just doing this, or you just draw the edges according to every term in your drawn probability, then we finish, the, we finish our Bayesian network. The edges, we can also like a well, single edge represents a conditional probability. Instead, we should see because because it's possible that you have multiple parents, right? So you can only say, okay, all the edges pointing to the same node represent conditional probability. Yeah, all edges. Uh, pointing to the same node. Like for example, for P of C given A and B, right? So we got two, a, two edges pointing to the same node C. So this guy, this guy, this guy, the three things together correspond to this P of C given A and B. Any other question? Okay, so next we're gonna use a, <coughs> a little bit more complex example to show uh, to showcase how we create a Bayesian uh, neural network, right? So we got a probability model of uh, five random variables, x1 to x5. So we can decompose this uh, drawn probability in this way, like p of x1 times p of x2 times p of x3, p of x4 given x1 to 3, p of x5 given x1, x3, p of x6 given x4, x7 given x4 and x5. Right? So how can we draw a Bayesian network? So first, if you look at P of X1, we know that there's no parent, or there's no condition part, right? So there's no incoming edge pointing to X1. Similar things happen to X2 and X3, right? So we just uh, finish the three, first the three terms, right? And then we look at the fourth term, which is P of X4, given X1, X2, and X3. So now we know that the condition part consists of three variables, x1 to x3. Right? That means x1 to x3 are all parents of uh, x4. Right? So that means we're gonna draw an edge of each parent to x4. Okay? So you can see that x1, there's an edge pointing to x4, x2, edge pointing to x4, x3, an edge pointing to x4. Okay? So finish. When we finish adding the three edges, we finish the term here, right? So now we move to the next term, 
this is conditional probability of x5 given x1, x3. Okay. So that means that x5 has two parents, x1, x3. We're going to draw an edge from x1 to x5 and x3 to x5 accordingly. That's where here on these two edges uh, uh, are generated, right? And then we move to the next term, which is P of x6 given x4. So there's only one parent of x6, uh, which is x4. So we'll draw an edge from x3 to x6, right? And then finally, we'll look at P of x7 given x4 and x5. Right? It has two parents, x4 and x5. So we're going to draw an edge from x4 to x7 and x5 to x7. And that's it. We finish our um, creation of the, we finish, we finish the creating uh, our Bayesian network representation of this uh, uh, model. Any questions so far? Okay, great. So now, I um, want to stress that in general, Bayesian networks must be a directed cyclic graph abbreviated as DAG. Why is that the case? Sorry, can you, can you see it again? Yeah. And then? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Let me let me put his statement, like, let, let me um, put more details on his statement. This is very, very important. If there's a site, if, if you draw a Bayesian network and there contains some loop or cycle, this is not a valid Bayesian model. Uh, why? Because you see that if you do, if you have a cycle in your, your network, actually you don't have any well-defined probability sampling procedure of all the variables in this cycle. Right? How can we see that? Let us just use one, use two variables as an example, right? So suppose uh, I draw a Bayesian network, right? So the cycle is x1 connecting to x2, x2 connecting to x1, right? From this, we know that, okay, because x1 has a parent x2, meaning that if I want to sample x1, I must first sample x2, right? Because you can only sample from a conditional probability, which is conditional on this parent x2. Right? So now, if you want to sample x2, right? What can we see? X2. It's condition as one, right? X2 has parent X1. So meaning that if you want to sample X2, we must first sample X1, right? However, we want to sample X1, so we want to sample X2. However, if we want to sample X2, we need first to have a sample of X1, right? So there's a deadlock, right? You cannot generate uh, the samples uh, of X1, X2. So this applies to actually large loop, right? So you can try that was a, uh, sorry, three variables, okay. You see such, such kind of dialogue again, right? If you want to sample x1, you need to first sample x2. If you want to sample x2, you first sample x3. However, if you want to get x3, you need to first sample x1. So <clears throat> that's why a Bayesian network cannot be, cannot have any loops. So a cycle means each random variable right, can be sampled only if all the other random variables in the cycle have been sampled. Right? That means uh, every variable in this loop or in the cycle is sampling is depending on all the other random variables. Right? That forms a deadlock, meaning that the random variables in the cycle cannot be sequentially sampled. This law is based rule, says so based rule guarantees that the random variables can be uh, sequentially sampled while the decomposition of the joint probability. From base rule, we know that the joint probability always have some kind of decomposition procedure. From this decomposition, we can always sequentially sample each random variable. Okay. So now let us consider 
using Bayesian network to represent some kind of simple model we have a previous thing. Okay. So some uh, someone has asked like, what if uh, I have some like real data, I create a, a practical model on that data, I can represent it with uh, a Bayesian network, right? We can first take a look at this uh, polynomial regression model, right? So this, so T here is the observation, right? T is a vector. So we can write down the joint probability of the model parameters and also the data T as the prior of the W, prior of the model parameters W, multiplying with the n likelihood, right? So given W, um, we have some uh, probability distribution to generate each observation T of n. This is the joint probability. And then how can we represent this joint probability with a Bayesian network? I just to follow the rule, right? So about the definition of Bayesian network, right? So we're gonna first have a, a random variable W, right? And it's a prior W, it doesn't condition on any other random variables. So there's no incoming edge, right? In the given W, we sample each TN independently, right? So that's why we're gonna draw an edge from W to every TN, right? Because they're, we don't know an uh, indefinite number of the uh, examples n, so we just use dot to uh, list t1 to tn. Does it make sense? Okay. So if you want to make our model to be uh, more specific, right? So we know that in the prior, uh, we assume it's Gaussian prior, and uh, the 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 uh, the variance uh, is alpha times some kind of uh, identity matrix. So alpha is kind of hyperparameter. Right? And similarly, in the likelihood, we use a Gaussian likelihood, right? And the uh, the 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 variance of the likelihood is sigma squared, right? So once we know, once we specify multitudes in our joint probability, right? How do we uh, represent or draw the Bayesian network, which can reflect those details. So first, we're gonna use a small solid nose to represent deterministic parameters or hyperparameters or some uninterested observations. Like in our case, but we assume that, okay, the prior variance alpha and likelihood variance sigma square are kind of deterministic, some kind of hyperparameter. So we're gonna draw them as small solid nodes. Right? And then we use big empty nodes to represent the latent random variables, like W and TN before we observe any data. Right? And also in practice, because we have a, we might receive many, many examples. Right? Uh, we don't want to draw, like if we receive 100 examples, we don't want to draw 100 circles. Right? So, to uh, simplify the, to simplify, right? So we're gonna use a plate right, to represent the replicate part of the network, right? So <clears throat> here we put this blue box and at the corner we put N just means we're gonna replicate this part in the network for big N times. So each variable inside this plate are different, right? So it just means, okay, for n's example, right? We have Tn as the output, right? We have Xn as the input, Xn is the observed input, right? And given W and given Xn and given sigma square, we're gonna generate Tn, right? So this comes from this uh, likelihood, right? Or this likelihood. So it is a uh, TN has parents, the model parameters W, the input feature vector accent, and the <coughs> hyperparameter likelihood variance sigma square, right? So that's why we have three incoming edges uh, from accent, from sigma square, and from W, right? And here we put a plate, like put the 
blue plate just showing that okay we got many many instances of uh, n. And also to differentiate observed random variables and observed random variables, right? We're gonna shade the nodes which have already been observed. Like in our uh, uh, in practice, we know that we assume those outputs have been have already been observed. We call it training outputs, right? So we use shaded nodes to represent those TNs, right? However, W, the model parameters are we do not know, right? We want to aim for the posterior distribution of W given observed TNs. That's why we still keep it as anti circle. So this is the most commonly used uh, protocol, protocol to draw Bayesian networks. So any questions so far? Okay, great. So yeah, when I was uh, a grad student, right? Uh, because I'm doing research in probability modeling, right? So the very first step you're gonna create a probability model, right? So my my rule of thumb, I I will, I will always first uh, draw some graphical model representation, and then I try to write down the joint probability. Right? But now I'm uh, I'm so familiar with all those uh, stuff, so I kind of ignore the joint step. I just write down the joint probability. But it's always always a good practice like to write down some graphical representation um, of your drawn probability, which can give you some kind of insight and inspiration right, for your model design. So uh, something we should keep in mind, like, uh, the network structure, the basic network structure is determined by the factorization of the drawn probability. Right? So we draw the graph, or draw a network according to the term in the factorized joint probability, right? It means that if you use a different factorization, even eventually they gave exactly the same joint probability, the graph structure will be different, right? So we can take a look, right? So if we use this decomposition, over the drawn probability. So P of A times P of B given A, P of C given A and B. So our graph will be, you know, A and uh, B given A and uh, C given A and B, right? But if you use a second factorization, which is equivalent to the first one, uh, which is equivalent to the, I mean, in the sense of that computing the joint probability, right? So if you first decompose B, first multiply marginal probability B and then B and C given B and A given B and C, what will happen is that, okay, you're gonna draw B first and then you're gonna draw C given B and then given B and C, you draw A. So structure, Varies. That means even from the joint distribution perspective, the models are can be equivalent, but they can be represented by different structures. There's, there's no like one-to-one -one mapping between the base model and the its network structure. So then that came to the point, how to design the factorization of the joint probability is the K of the produced model, okay? Because uh, the factorization determines the structure, the structure reflects properties, the structure helps you to do the inference efficiently. Okay? Of course, one can use the full Bayesian formula, meaning that I can always represent Use base rule to represent P of X1 to Xn by P of X1 times P of X2 given X1, P of X3 given X1 and X2 to the duh, P of Xn given X1 to Xn minus one. Right? You can always use this full Bayesian formula, right? But the network, if you draw a network for this, you see it is a fully connected network. X1 
x2 will be connected by x1, right? x3 will be connected by x1, x2. Every variable is connected by all the previous variable. So this is a densely connected network. But our goal is not to just use densely connected network. Instead, we want to uh, use simplified structure. I mean, that I want to delete the edges as many as possible. Those simplified structure kind of reduce the model complexity, incorporate our domain knowledge, and also facilitate computation. Like we previously mentioned a little bit, right? If your structure is concise, right? Like it's like a chain, like like a tree, then there is a highly there is a highly efficient computation procedure to give you the exact posterior distribution. Like right? however, if your network is densely connected, like numerous loops and clicks, then the exact computation is really very hard. So that means the structure is very, very important for you to design an expressive, an easy, and efficient probabilistic problem. So, but what does the simplification structure mean in terms of probabilistic sense? It means the uh, conditional independence. So next we're gonna discuss uh, about how different types of uh, network structure reflect different types of uh, condition independence. So there's kind of correspondence between the structure and condition independence. Your model assumption and the model uh, simplification is reflected in this uh, condition independence. Let's see a concrete example. We're gonna use this, uh, uh, we're gonna discuss about this linear Gaussian model. So what is linear Gaussian model? Um, basically, suppose we're dealing with like N random variables, X1 to X1. So linear Gaussian model just means uh, for any conditional probability, right? Xi, conditional is parent. So it's parent can be a bunch of uh, our random variables, right? So a model this conditional probability as a Gaussian distribution, where the mean is a linear combination of all, all of its parents, plus some kind of bias, V of I, and with some variance, uh, nu of I. This is our model. Okay. So <clears throat> if we use a fully connected network, meaning that we do not put any simplification of network structure. We we'll use a full base formula, right? So our model, our joint probability should be like this, right? So it's P of X1 and P of X2 given X1, P of X3 given X1, X2, da, da, da. P of Xn given X1, Xn minus one, right? And each, term, each term in this joint probability is a conditional Gaussian, right? It's a linear Gaussian where the mean is a linear combination of all of its parents. So now I want to ask how many parameters uh, do we need to learn this model? So first of all, for P of X1, we know that it doesn't have any parents. We only have one bus, right? Let us just assume this various parameter, parameter is just constant, which is ignored, right? So for this guy, P of X1, we need one parameter, right? For P of X2, given X1, how many parameters do we need? How many parents? Does it have one parent, right? So it has uh, one weight for that parent and the bus term. So you need two, right? And how about P of X3 given X1, X2? Three, right? You got two parents. That means you have two weights and plus bus term, three. Right? 
you can just increase the number of parameters for every conditional probability. And for the last one, okay, we got n minus one parents, okay, n minus one weights plus bias, okay, we got n parameters. Right? So if it adds up the number of parameters, it tells that we need a, a number of parameters uh, n square, right? In the scale of n square. So you can imagine that the number of parameters of your model, if you use a dense plant connected basic uh, network to model, right? It increases uh, quadratically along with the number of parameters, the number of the parameters. Does it make sense? Right? So if you draw, if you draw the graphic model, right? Uh, sorry, it's drawn Bayesian network, right? It will be like this, this one, I x one to x two, and both x one x two connect x three, and uh, all three x one x two x three connects to x four, and so on. Right? It's very dense, and correspondingly, your number of parameters uh, grows uh, quadratically. Right? Um, it's kind of uh, large, especially when we're dealing with large models. And naturally, we want a, a simpler model, right? We want uh, the model to have a simpler structure. Right? If you take a look, like we're gonna often, it says there's a often used a strategy, like we use a chain structure. This is our graphing model, right? So we're gonna just uh, connect uh, so, uh, successive nodes, right? So it connects one to x2 and connects to x2, x3, right? We do not connect x1 to x3. And it'll connect x4, x3 to x4 until xn minus one to xn, right? We just uh, delete all the uh, the connections from all um, from preceding nodes other than the immediate preceding node, right? So if uh, we still use this linear Gaussian modeling framework, right? How many parameters uh, do we need for this uh, simplified Bayesian network? Just ON, right? Because each in the joint probability, right? Let me try to write it more explicitly. Right? You write it down, which is P of X1 times P of X2 given X1, right? P of X3 given X2, right? It does not condition x1 anymore until p of xn given xn minus one. Okay? So now each term in the joint probability only uh, is conditional on one variable. Right? So only need s in one weight plus some bias, right? And it's proportional to n. So you can see that simplified structure corresponds to a, a reduced number of parameters. And this one is more, much more acceptable in practice. So now we have seen some concrete examples showing that, okay, uh, why is this uh, useful to use some simplified structure, right? And then the next we're gonna talk about uh, how does this simplification reflect, right? Uh, we mentioned that is condition independence. So what is conditional independence? Suppose we have a three random variables, right? A, B, and C. Okay. <coughs> we call A is conditional independent of B given C if P of A given B and C just directly equal to P of A given C, meaning that it doesn't matter if, you, if it is conditional B or not. Okay. And as another, Equivalent representation is to say like P of A given B. It's not like that. P of A and B given C, the joint probability of A and B given C can be written of B A given C, P of B given C. Okay. So there are, those are um, are equivalent. Both defines that A and B are conditionally independent given C, right? And for convenience, right, we don't always want to write down that uh, drawn probability, but we can use this to represent the condition independence, meaning that given C and B 
are condition independent. We use some kind of like, you know, orthogonal, orthogonality or symbol or perpendicular symbol to re represent the uh, independence, right? That's our definition. So our goal is to detect kinds of like condition independence for arbitrary Bayesian network, right? Um, to do this, right? To do this, we're gonna start with some uh, like basis, uh, basic independence, condition independence structure. And later we'll, we'll give a general algorithm like by running this algorithm, we can tell for arbitrary three set of random variables, A, B, and C, if random variable set A are conditionally independent random variables B, given a third set of random variables C. Right? So let us first see some example, right? So to see that how a simplified structure, how the condition independence is reflected by the simplified structure, right? So if we use full Bayesian formula to represent the joint for A and B and C, uh, we can represent it as P of C times P of B given C and P of, time, um, P of A given B and C. Okay? So suppose we have uh, this conditional independence, right? A and B are conditionally independent given C. Okay? So that means this guy can be written as P of A given C. Why? Because uh, Condition C and B are independent. Conditional probability is equal to the Marvin probability, right? And then if we draw the Bayesian network for the drawn probability now, right? so we can see that, okay, first the draw circle C, right? Represent random variable C. And then we have a conditional probability of B given C. So we have an edge from C pointing to A. Of pointing to B, right? And if we have P of A given C, we have edge pointing to A. Right? So now we can see we have uh, this condition independence uh, help us to delete one edge in the graph, right? If we don't have uh, this condition independence, we, we should follow this, right? And then that means uh, we have to uh, add an edge from uh, B to A as well, right? And now, if we have this condition independence, if we introduce this condition independence, right, this edge is deleted. So in practice, right, um, when we design a Bayesian network, we're, gonna, we're not gonna first uh, come out a set of condition independence assumption and then try to draw the graph. That is a little bit unintuitive, right? Instead, we're gonna first uh, consider a sampling a generative procedure to sample all the random variables of interest to given the structure. And then from the structure, we'll try to uh, infer what kind of condition independence it reflects. Right? For example, suppose we got four random variables, x1 to x4, right? This is my modeling, right? I can draw this uh, basic network first to represent my probability model. So we know that in my, um, uh, in my mind, right, I'm gonna first sample x1, and then sample x2 given x1, sample x3 given x1, then given x2, x3, sample x4, right? This is my basic network. Then from this network structure, we can analyze what kind of condition independence uh, on the line, right? So first we know that Condition on x1, x2, and x3 are in random, right? Okay. And then, condition on x, uh, x2 and x3, sorry. Condition on x2 and x3, x1 and x4 are independent. 
So sometimes this might not be uh, uh, easy to see or to uh, find all possible condition dependence. That's why in a modern design, we're gonna first uh, create our own sampling procedure and based on structure, we're trying to, we try to test the, the condition dependence. So here is our general question. Given a possibly complex Bayesian network, right? given arbitrary non-intersecting sets of nodes A and B and C, so A and B, C are three sets, they're not overlapping with each other. Right? How do we test if given C, A and B are condition dependent? To analyze the properties of our Bayesian network model, right? this is important to know. We're on the same page, right? About problem setting. So we're gonna provide a general algorithm to efficiently test for arbitrary A and B and C if the condition independence uh, is correct or not. As we previously mentioned, we're gonna start with several basic cases. And based on the specific cases, uh, you're gonna run a so-called algorithm called a base ball, right? And uh, if it turns out that the ball from A, starting from any node in A, cannot find a pass to reach any node in, in B, given C, then that means A and B are conditionally independent for C. We're gonna look look into the detail later. But right? first, we're gonna first look at the, uh, first we're gonna look at the three basic cases. So the first case is called tail to tail. All those three cases are about three random variables, three random variable system, right? A and B and C, right? The first case is called tail to tail, meaning that C is uh, in the middle, right? And tail to tail means that um, you're gonna have an arrow tails connecting to C, the intermediate node C, right? So this is a tail, this is a tail. This is why it's called tail to tail, right? So <clears throat> as we, um, introduced, right? We use shaded nodes to represent that C is observed or its condition. Right? So if C is observed, then we have this uh, conclusion. Oh, sorry. We have this conclusion. Uh, first, if C is not observed, namely that your condition on nothing, then A and B are not independent. They're generally dependent. However, if C is observed, meaning that we condition on C, then A and B are independent. That is, A and B are conditionally independent given C. How do we see this? How do we see this? We can first start with a unconditional case, meaning that I don't assume any variable is observed and is conditioned. So we want to look at if A and B, the joint probability of A and B can be decomposed of some uh, two factors. Right? One factor only contains A, the other factor only contains B. This will correspond to uh, independence, right? Because if they are independent, that means this P of A times P of B, right? P of A doesn't contain B and P of B doesn't contain A. Right? Let's see if we can derive this. So from this uh, network structure, right, we can write down our joint probability decomposition as P of C, right? C doesn't have any parent. So we first write down the margin probability of C, and then P of A given C, and then P of B given C, right? For both A and B, they have very parent, one parent C, so we have a, a one condition variable C, right? So if we want to get the joint distribution A and B, we need to marginalize our C, right? So essentially is the marginalization of the joint probability for all the three variables. 
so now if we substitute the decomposed structure for the drawing probability, we got this right, P of C times P of A given C times C of B given C and D of C. Okay. So from this integration, what can we observe? We can observe that actually this integration cannot separate A and B, right? You got one term that only contains A and C, right? You got another term that only contains B and C, right? However, you're gonna integrate out C, right? That means A and B will be coupled according to C, right? Through the integration, they're tightly coupled. So, Eventually, it will give you some. Uh, intact. Function of A and B, right? it won't give you F and A and G of B. A and B cannot be separate out. That's why in general, if you condition nothing, A and B are not independent to each other. Does it make sense? So <clears throat> let us look at the second case. Right? If C is uh, observed and conditioned, do we still, do we have like A and B are condition independent? So in that case, we just need to check P of A and B Condition on C, right? If we can write it as uh, P of A given C, P of B given C, that means they're condition independent, right? So again, we're gonna leverage uh, the definition and structure, right? So this guy is P of A, B, and C divided by P of C, right? So apply this uh, decomposition again. This is a uh, reflected from this uh, network, right? So it is a uh, P of uh, C times P of uh, A given C times of B given C and divided by P of C. Now what can we observe? The marginal probability of C are canceled, right? So you only leave uh, the product of uh, Condition probability of A given C and P of B given C, right? which exactly is this guy. Right? Does it make sense? Right? So now we immediately see given C and B are indeed condition independent. Right? This is uh, base case one. Right? So the second base case is called head to tail. Again, C is an intermediate variable which connecting A and B. Right? But now the shape is like head to tail. That means uh, you have a uh, C is attached with an arrow head and an arrow tail. That's why it's called head to tail, right? So the graph is like this. The network is like this. First A connecting to C, from A to C, and then from C to B. So we'll still see that if do not condition on anything, A and B are not independent. However, if this condition on C, then A and B are independent. So I will leave it as exercise for you to justify this. Just the form of, just apply the network structure like to get the composition of drawn probability and do some kind of analysis. You will immediately get these two results. So the last base case is a little on. It's opposite to the previous two cases. So the previous two cases like we got tail to tail we go head to tail, 
we arrive at the same conclusion that is condition of nothing and B are not independent. But condition C, they are independent. But in third case, which we call head to head, the conclusion is opposite. If C is attached with two arrowheads, meaning that both edges are from, are from other nodes and then arrive at C, then our conclusion becomes if condition nothing A and B are independent. If condition C, A and B are not independent. So okay, first take a look at this one, right? Condition of nothing and being independent just means that we need to show that P of A and B equals to a P of A times P of B, right? Let's see if we can apply this conclusion. If we can arrive at this conclusion, like right, given this model, right? So given this model structure, we know that the joint probability will be a P of A times P of B times P of C given A and B, right? Because C has two parents, A and B, right? And then if you want to obtain the joint probability of A and B only, right? we need to marginalize out C, right? So we're gonna substitute this decomposed structure for the drawing probability in our integration, right? So now who can tell me what's this, right? What's this integration? Yeah, exactly, right? Remember, here we only integrate with C, right? P of A and P of B are kind of constant to C. You can know without, and then you just integrate the conditional probability with respect to C, which is just one, right? So now we then we get the result, just the product of P of A and P of B, right? So now we can see immediately P of A and B equals to P of A times uh, P of B, right? However, if you are doing this, you won't be able to show that. P of A and B given C. We can now show this. And I will leave it an exercise for you guys to, 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 to look into that. So basically you, you will meet kind of similar effect we just mentioned before, right? But in that case, um, we mentioned is that, okay, you are not conditioned on anything. Uh, you will see some coupling of uh, A and B right, because of integration. But here, in this case, you will see the coupling when you condition on C. And it's it's actually not only this case. We have a head to head, a more general case. That is, if you have a, you have the following structure. That is, A and B are kind of co-parents for some third variable C, and C is a parent about some some other variables. So the chain parent is a chain of parent structure until you have some descendant D. If this D is observed and conditioned, then A and B are not independent condition on the descendant D. So this is a special uh, case, right? As compared with the uh, head to tail and tail to tail case. But overall, we're gonna use these three basic cases uh, to uh, run the so-called baseball algorithm, which can guarantee you to find out, uh, to test the arbitrary three sets of variables, A and B and C, if they are conditionally independent. Okay, let's uh, stop here uh, today. In the next lecture, we're gonna talk about the exponent way effect of this head-to-head -head structure, and then we move to the baseball algorithm. Then we talk about uh, the definition of the 
uh, undirected uh, graphic model. 